mention something about that hymn we just sang, because that, it, some of the language in it can sound kind of strange in today's world. Uh, those words were written by Isaac Watts, and I did not know to just recently that hymn was written as a reaction to uh, criticism that he was receiving. Because Isaac Watts, uh, growing up, was in the church, grew up in the time when in the church you only sang psalms. That's all you sang, were the words of the psalms. Those were the only acceptable psalms that you could sing in worship. And I remember reading once that at one point he was telling his father, complaining about how kind of slow and out of date the psalms were, and his father said, if you could then write better ones. <laughs> so he started writing hymns, and he caught a great deal of flack from the established church because his hymns weren't taken straight from the psalms. Uh, they, they berated him. And so that hymn, that one line is kind of a response to that where he says, uh, let those refuse to sing who never knew our God. But children of the heavenly king can sing his praise abroad. He was kind of responding to his critics. And indeed, how many times did the psalmist tell us that we're to sing a new song to the Lord? Amen? Now remember that the next time we sing a new hymn, you go, where did they get that? I've never heard that before. It's scriptural. <laughs> We've been looking over the month of July at the idea of being rooted and grounded in Christ. And I, I will be honest, I told you the outset part of this was for me to feel like I could give a little bit of an introduction of who we are, but also talk about who we are as the body of Christ. And we've looked about uh, where we've come from, whose we are, who loves us. Today we're going to talk about where am I headed? Where am I headed? I want to begin by reading a passage from 2 Corinthians 5.9. 2 Corinthians 5. That's a good scripture too. We'll come back to that one. We got it. I'll read it for you. How's that? We'll come back to this. I'm sorry. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away for it, away from it. So we make it our goal to do what? Please him. The story is told of a businessman whose flight taking him to an important business engagement was delayed. And when his plane finally landed, he rushed to the airport out to the passenger pickup area, quickly found a cab, jumped in the back seat, and shouted to the driver, I have a very important appointment, and I can't afford to be late. Step on it. And the cab driver turned around briefly and he started to speak. He said, oh, okay, sir, but, and the, and the man shut him off. He said, I don't have time for any chit-chat. Get moving. Get out of this airport as fast as you can. So the driver shrugged his shoulders and he sped away. He managed to get out of the airport complex in good time, proceeded to fly down the highway, then he was coming through city streets as fast as he dared. After driving for about 15 minutes, the businessman kind of caught his breath and he said, Cabby, how much longer until we arrive at my destination? And the cab driver responded, Sir, I have absolutely no idea, since you never bothered to tell me where it is we're going. <laughs> you know, if you ever hope to arrive at your destination in this world, it helps to know where you're going, doesn't it? You need to have a goal in mind, something you're aiming at, something you're planning for, something you're focusing upon. One of my professors in past years was fond of saying, if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. All too often, people in this world set their goals too low. They set out thinking if they could just go to the right school, get the right job, marry the right person, make enough money, get the right car, live in a nice home, etc., 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 then their life will be complete and they'll be happy. They will have achieved their goal. And as they embark on what they consider to be an effort to climb that ladder of success, they often discover somewhere along the way that they've set the ladder against the wrong building. Years ago, I was pastoring a church, and I met Jim. Jim was a young man, probably in his late 20s, maybe early 30s. He attended one of the little churches I pastored. And that church had a Bible study, and they would meet in various homes. And one week, Jim invited the Bible study to come meet at his home that week. And he gave us the address. When I pulled up, I was impressed. I'd never been to his home. He lived in a beautiful, brand-new house. 
gorgeous lot, nicely landscaped, a beautiful pond out front. In his garage, there were two nice new vehicles parked. When he walked me into the house, I noticed it was beautifully furnished and looked like something out of better homes and gardens. And I commented to him that, you know, you have a beautiful home. And I can still remember his response. Jim looked at me and said, this is not a home. It's simply a house. I had a home. I was married, had two children, a loving wife. I had a good job. I worked long hours so we could buy all the things we thought we needed or wanted. I worked overtime every chance I could. And I convinced myself I was doing it for my family so we could have everything we needed. But I was never home. And my family fell apart. And my wife divorced me. And now I get to see my kids every other weekend when I have visitation rights. Pastor, this is not a home. I had a home once. This is merely a house. A few months ago, I had the opportunity to talk with a young man on the day of his college graduation. And we were talking about goals, what he wanted in life. And he told me these were his goals. To find a job where he could make about 400000 a year. <laughs> to find a woman willing to marry him. His words. To be able to retire at an early age. He looked a little surprised when I told him he was aiming too low. <laughs> that he needed to set higher goals for his life. His definition of what he thought would satisfy him and make him happy would probably, in the long run, not give him the satisfaction he was looking for. I told him, I've known a few extremely wealthy people in my life. A few. Most of them are miserable. And I've known individuals who had little next to nothing materially, but who were happy and appreciative of life. If true joy and happiness and fulfillment could be found in simply acquiring enough stuff, doesn't it seem like we'd read a whole lot fewer stories about Hollywood stars, musical legends, and other famous people who end up spiraling and crashing in spite of all they have? Wouldn't that make sense? They should be the happiest people in the world. Doesn't read that way. We're designed for something more. Centuries ago, St. Augustine of Hippo wrote in his Confessions, You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Not nearly so long ago, C.S. Lewis wrote in Mere Christianity, If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. Supposedly, Blaise Pascal, a French mathematician, physicist, inventor, writer, Catholic theologian who lived in the 1600s, supposedly, he said, inside each of us is a God-shaped hole or void, a place inside our hearts only God can fill. I say supposedly because scholars can't even seem to agree if he's the one that originated that statement or not. The bottom line is, if we are truly created by God for God, then it's safe to deduce that we can never truly fulfill our purpose in life, find our fullest meaning on this earth, or truly experience the joy and abundant life of Christ that he intended, apart from walking in right relationship with him. In Philippians 3, we read these words of Paul. Not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal. He's admitting he's not there yet. But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus take hold, took hold of me. Read that underlying part. Back it up just a minute. Read that underlying part with me. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Did you catch those words? In spite of all that Paul had done for the kingdom of God, in spite of the churches he planted, in spite of all that he had nurtured, in spite of the lives he impacted, 
In spite of all that, he affirmed, I've not yet arrived at the goal. I press hold on, but take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. In other words, he, he affirms that Christ managed to get a hold of him first. The touch and transform his heart and mind and life for the sake of the kingdom, and that transformation was ongoing. And then he says, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of one thing I do. Read it with me, because this is important. Forgetting what is behind. What was that again? <clears throat> Forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. That's not so easy to do, is it? We spend a lot of time and energy focusing on what's behind us, on what was. Paul sought to please and honor Christ in all he said and did. He realized what we need to realize. We can't change the past. But hopefully we can learn from it. God's promise is to forgive our past sins. Every time we share in communion, we're reminded of that. This is the cup. This blood is the cup of the new covenant that you might know the forgiveness of sins. We spend too much time looking back, fixating on what was when Christ is calling us forward. Paul says we need to strain towards what is ahead, to lean into where Christ is leading us. You ever see someone, a uh, cross-country runner, when they cross the finish line? They're leaning in. They're, they're, they're leaning in to try to cross that line with every ounce of their being. It's not always easy to forget what's behind and straying ahead. Because in the world and the adversary, they like to remind us of what we once were. While the Holy Spirit calls us into becoming new creations in Christ. Forgetting what's behind. Pressing on towards what's ahead. Where are we headed? Well, if we surrendered our hearts and lives to Christ Jesus, if we acknowledge Him as Savior and Lord and Redeemer, then we're following in the footsteps of Christ and we shouldn't be too surprised if we encounter some difficulties along the way. I don't know where the bad theology took root that we think because Christ suffered, I shouldn't have to. That's not at all Christian theology. Jesus says that. If they treated the master this way, don't be surprised if they treat the student this way. If I suffer, don't be surprised if you have to suffer. But Romans 8.18 tells us, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. I like those, those three words, not worth comparing. When the way is difficult, when obedience is costly, when we struggle to move forward or just to hold our ground, Paul says our present sufferings don't even compare to what Christ has in store for us. All that awaits us in the kingdom of God. There's an old gospel hymn written by Esther K. Lustoy. That's not a name I'd ever heard before, but I remember the hymn. Because on my worst days, going to college and seminary, and even now, some 30-some years later, on my difficult days, I find myself humming the tune. Let me just read you some of the words. Oft times the day seems long, our trials hard to bear. We're tempted to complain, to murmur in despair. But Christ will soon appear to catch his bride away. All tears forever over in God's eternal day. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of his dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. I don't know about you, but that hymn has sustained me. There have been some days I've been going through stuff and I find myself singing that hymn and I get to that it will be worth it all part. I would find myself inwardly looking to God and saying, 
okay if you say so, but it's going to have to be pretty darn good. <clears throat> you know what? It will be. Hebrews 12 tells us, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, others who have run the path and finished the race, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on... On who? Jesus. Not your neighbor? Not the pastor? Not some government official who's going to answer all of our problems? Fixing our eyes on the pioneer and perfecter of our faith who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Where are we headed? To the arms of Christ. We're not finished yet. We're called to persevere. That means to keep on, to hang in there. Even when we're weary, even when we're tempted to give up, even when we don't see results. We each have a race to run, and if we hope to stay on course, to finish the course, we have to keep our eyes and hearts focused on Jesus. He's the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. I like that. The pioneer, the one who led the way, the perfecter, the one who brings it to completion. The old King James Version translates it just slightly different. It says, fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The one who wrote the story and the one who will write the ending. He's the one who reached out to us in the first place. He's the one who started us on this course. And he's the one who will be waiting to receive us in the glory at the finish line. When our kids were in school, uh, two of my kids ran cross country. You ever have kids running cross country? It's not like a football game or swimming where you can go sit on a chair and watch them. You go to cross country, you might get to see them start, and you got to run way down someplace. Maybe see them pass you by once, and then you got to run. You got to run back up if you want to see them get to the finish line. One of the kids on the cross country team, I remember, was Joey. Joey was about this tall, short legs. Not really athletic. And Joey decided he was going out for cross country. And Joey would run. And you know the thing about Joey is he always, always, always finished last. And it was usually a long time after everybody else finished. But you know one of the neat things I saw? Was everybody waited around. Because they knew Joey would finish. He would never drop out. He'd keep running. And he might have time that's way longer after everyone else was done and caught their breath and rested. But the parents, the adults, the other kids would be standing there at the finish line, cheering him on because Joey was determined he might not be the fastest one out there, but he was going to finish the race. His perseverance was touching him. If you're sitting in this room drawing breath, your race is not over yet. You may have, some of you, retired from your earthly vocation. You're still in the race for Christ. As long as you draw breath, when you reach that finishing line, he'll be there to welcome you and bring you home. In Philippians one, we read a touching letter from Paul. He says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day from until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry on the completion until the day of Christ Jesus. There is a line in the Westminster Shorter Catechism. I know you stayed up at night just reading that. Catechisms were basically ways of simply giving questions and answers, basics of the Christian faith that you would teach young believers coming into the faith. And one of the first questions asked is, what is the chief end of mankind? Ladies, what is the chief end of humanity? How's that? And I love, I love the response. 
Our, say our, now, our chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him. Now let me tell you, did that surprise you when you saw the blank in your bulletin? Did you really think your chief end was to enjoy God forever? Didn't Jesus say, I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly? I've come that your joy may be full. We only achieve that as we run our race faithfully. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. So, where are you headed? And if you haven't thought about that for a while, maybe you need to. Sometimes we get so caught up in life, we're like that businessman in the back seat of the car. We're moving awful fast, we're going somewhere, but we haven't stopped to make clear exactly where it is. Forgetting what is behind, straining towards what is ahead, may we press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called us heavenward in Christ. Bow your heads with me. Father God, from time to time we need to pause and reflect on where we're headed. Oh, we spend a lot of time reflecting on where we've been. But where are you leading? Where are you calling? Where are you challenging us to step out in faith and move forward? What direction are you leading? And are we paying close enough attention to follow? Or are we just meandering off down the path? May our goal in this life be to please and honor you above all else. Lead us, Father. Open our eyes, open our hearts, open our ears. Give us the courage, the strength, the perseverance to finish our course well. This we ask in the name of Christ Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, our Redeemer, and our King. Amen.